I miss my calling as a mad scientist. For hundreds of years now, people have asked the question, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Obviously, there are arguments for and against both answers. Whilst making the atomic bomb was probably, in the grand scheme of things, a bad idea, I bet the first cave person who banged two pieces of flint together and created a spark felt pretty smug about it. <laughs> I feel pretty smug when I make a fire in the forest like using a lighter. <laughs> Uh, can you imagine that? The first guy to be like, Oh my god, what the fuck is this? I've made fire! That is, assuming that he or she didn't accidentally burn down the cave. While you could legitimately argue that this particular experiment paved the way for almost all future scientific endeavors, it does not mean that all subsequent experiments were sensible ones. In fact, many experiments conducted by so-called scientists... <laughs> so-called scientists... <laughs> A bit so ridiculous that they border on the unbelievable. Today's episode, we're going to take a look at some of these, so grab your stimulant of choice. So grab your stimulants of choice. No, just joking. It's coffee. It's coffee. And that's just salt. Or sugar? Salt. Why do I not believe you? And we shall take a look at some of the scientific experiments that were so bizarre that they sound made up, giving LSD to elephants. <laughs> Dang, didn't you say these were rubbish ideas? This sounds like a brilliant... This sounds like it could genuinely be a TV show. The first entry goes some way to conclusively proving that some scientists should not be allowed access to narcotics. In 1962, in the city of Oklahoma, a group of researchers were wrestling with a hypothetical problem. A problem that I'm sure has plagued many of us and caused incalculable sleepless nights throughout the world. Is that question really going to be like... <laughs> Why can't you sleep, dear? Oh, I keep thinking about what if we give LSD to elephants. <laughs> I just can't get it out of my mind. Exactly what would happen if you gave an LSD? Exactly what would happen if you gave LSD to an elephant? Really, that, I, I, I was joking, but that's actually what they were wondering. Unfortunately for elephant kind, these researchers access both to an elephant and a seemingly limitless supply of LSD. So, on Friday the 1st of August... They decided to cease with the boring hypothetical debate and settle it once for all. To that end, the director of the city zoo, observed by two researchers from the university, used a tranquilizer dart to administer 297 milligrams of the drug to a male elephant. Look, I have no idea. I've never done LSD. But all I know about LSD is that it comes, like, on a little piece of paper, right? It's literally like a drop. And 297 milligrams isn't like one thing of paracetamol. What do you call it? Tylenol in America? Acetamiophen? Whatever that the, the, the name of the drug is. Paracetamol. One of those pills is like 500, me 500 milligrams, right? So 297 milligrams is a lot more than a fucking drop. And I know it's an elephant, but that does seem like an awful lot. Definitely salt. I do okay. For those of you with little to no experience with this allegedly fun and interesting chemical, 297 milligrams is a serious dose. Good, I'm glad I was right, Dave. Although opinions vary, it is approximately 3,000 times the average recreational dose for a human. Holy sh**. You know what? Elephants are not 3,000 times bigger than us. I mean, they're a lot. Hey, Siri, how much bigger is an elephant compared to a man? Well, Siri just told me that it's 1541, which is very helpful if I'd asked for the time Siri Siri how much does an elephant weigh just dead silence on that one got nothing for me have you Siri you piece of shit. now I just won't ever know how much an elephant weighs compared to a human how am I going to be able to sleep at night Did the elephant experience a trip of epic proportions? You bet your ass he did! Well, yes. Unfortunately, it was not the sort of trip that researchers were hoping for. Rather, it was a one-way trip to wherever it is that elephants go after they die. Oh my god, elephant heaven, Dave. <laughs> oh my god, elephant heaven, Dave. That's where they go. <laughs> they killed a fucking elephant with LSD. That's what happens when you give it 297 milligrams of LSD. Why didn't you start off with something less, like a drop? Or just be like, well, if humans take a drop, let's multiply that. Let's give him, like... I don't know, let's say an elephant's a hundred times bigger. Let's give him a hundred drops. Done. Easy. Or can't, maybe we'll just test it on a human-sized elephant, like a baby elephant or something. 
That sounds much more ethical. After expressing his initial displeasure with being shot with the dart, the elephant in question stomped and trumpeted around his enclosure for a couple of minutes before falling to the ground and becoming unresponsive. Although the researchers and presumably the zoo director attempted to revive the elephant with copious quantities of anti-narcotic drugs, he would pass away one hour later. Wait, I mean, I know that LSD is a narcotic because it makes you like, woo, but isn't an anti-narcotic drug the sort of thing like, is it naloxone that they give you if you're overdosing on like opiates? or heroin or whatever do they make one of those for lsd because if that's the case i'd be way more into trying lsd my problem with lsd is like i'd be like oh my god what if there's some bad trip because i've done hallucinogenic drugs once and it was intense and allegedly and i was like i don't really fancy doing lsd but if there was a drug that you could just be like oh it's not going very well and you'd just be like and it's over i'd be way more into trying it stop it Get some help. Now, you might think, as the researchers involved appeared to be, that this conclusively proved that elephants didn't react well to LSD. However, there was some debate as to whether or not the elephant had been killed by the LSD or the anti-narcotics that had been used in an attempt to revive him. Both. 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 Both is good. Of course, the only way to find out would be to repeat the experiment, and 20 years later, somebody did just this. <laughs> you elephant murderer, what the fuck? This time, two elephants were used, and instead of using a tranquilizer dart, the same amount of LSD was given to the elephants in their water. Now, I'm not a scientist, but even I know that there are too many variables in this repeat experiment to make it a fair test. Yet, yeah, this isn't science. You're just drugging an elephant for fun at this point. What the fuck? But this time, the elephants fared much better. They became quite sluggish, sat down more than normal, and made some weird noises, but seemed to make a full recovery after a couple of hours. Given these two markedly different responses, coupled with the fact that nobody appears to have repeated the experiment, we still don't know very much about how elephants react to LSD, to which I can just say, oh no! Anyway! Maybe the first elephant was just a wuss. Can an amputated head survive on its own? Ever seen Futurama? Many times. Actually, I don't think I say that. I've just seen it once. I haven't seen all of it. I'm, it's fine. It's enjoyable. I liked it as a kid. Ever wondered, didn't they start making it again? Yeah, we're back. Yeah! Yeah! Ever wondered if heads really could survive in jars on their own? <laughs> Actually, yes. <laughs> like, this is what I have wondered about. Not ever since I read that Roll Doll short story, where there's like the brain in the jar and his eyes go tight. Like, when he's, he's disapproving of something and it's just his brain in there. It's fucked up. I still think about that. I don't know why I read that as a kid. I think I was like, oh, Roll Doll, like the BFG and sh and I read this book of short stories by Roald Dahl. I was like, what the f*** is this? Oh, Roald Dahl also writes for adults? Why did anyone warn me? I was a kid. Well, it turns out that people have been wondering that very same thing for a long time now. And the answer is yes, sort of. Enter Soviet position. Oh, no, is this the dog guy? We are. The guy who's, like, chopping the heads off dogs and like, attaching them to, like, other dogs and shit. Sergey, what the f***? I don't know what I thought I was getting into with this video, but it's exactly this is exactly the sort of shit I should expect it, and so should you. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. During the late 1920s, Brookenecho. Wait, did I say that was his surname? Brookenecho. I don't know. It's some complicated Soviet name. Russian name, set about proving that it was, in fact, possible for a decapitated head to survive without the benefits of the previously attached body. In order to do this, he invented and built a basic machine to do the work of the heart and the lungs, removed the head from a perfectly functioning dog, and demonstrated the results at an international scientific conference. Can you imagine being at that conference? And someone's like, and that's the reason that we found in the Large Hadron Collider, or whatever the fuck it was back in the day, that this quark is doing this. And someone, someone else, and then some other dude just wheels out a cart. And it's like, Sergey, what's that? This, my friends, is head of a dog. <laughs> You'll be like, it's gonna be good. <laughs> According to people who were actually there, they did indeed respond to stimuli. When Sergey banged on the table with a hammer, the head flinched. When he shone light into its eyes, it blinked. But perhaps most disturbingly, when he fed a piece of cheese to the head, it proceeded to eat it, and the cheese came out of the hole where the esophagus should be. What the fuck, Sergey? Why? Although there are videos online that claim the head was capable of surviving for several hours, in actual fact, records indicate that the process only worked for a few minutes. It did, however, cause somewhat of a stir among the scientific community, along with pretty much everybody else. For example, when George Bernard Shaw heard about it, he said, I am even tempted to have my own head cut off so that I can continue to dictate plays and books without being bothered by illness, without having to dress and undress, without having to eat, without having anything else to do other than produce masterpieces of dramatic art and literature. All right, chill the fuck out. Who were the fuck are you? Samuel Beckett? No. Alright, chill the fuck out. Alright, chill the fuck out, George. 
<laughs> How will I ever continue to make my masterpieces after my death? How can humanity survive without me, the great George Bernard Shaw? It's like, chill, George. I, don't, I can't even name a single play, and I studied theatre. That's just because I have a terrible memory. I'm sure he wrote some famous sh that I don't care about. As far as I'm aware, this experiment- Hey Siri, what did George Bernard Shaw write? We found some web results. I don't know why I even try. How how soon can we replace Siri with ChatGPT? Because ChatGPT would be like, certainly, here is a f***ing answer to your question. And yes, I made up number four, but the first three are real. As far as I'm aware, this experiment has not been successfully replicated on humans outside of science fiction. I don't know, Dave. You never know what they're up to in China. This is probably a good thing. George Bernard Shaw sounds like an arrogant, self-obsessed wanker. So having him around forever would have certainly had the potential to become quite tedious. Yeah, I'm glad he's dead. F George Bernard Shaw, that cock, allegedly, in my opinion. He was dead. We don't have to worry about this. F you, George, you prick. Daddy, chill. Completely unnecessary sex experiments. There's no such thing as an unnecessary sex experiment, Dave. Although I imagine you're about to say, make what I said just then age terribly. So let's see. Maybe we'll have to cut it out if it turns out it's like, oh no, oh no, not with the pigs. No. The most unbelievable thing is <laughs> not David Cameron. Oh, what? Don't ask. You don't want to know. The most unbelievable thing about this next experiment is not how it was done, but that anybody found it necessary to do it at all. Having presumably never been outside or interacted with any people ever, Russell Clark, a psychology professor working at Florida State University, demanded an answer to the following question. Were young males or young females more likely to respond positively to the offer of a casual sexual encounter? Mate. <laughs> we all know the answer to this one. 99% better say yes. <laughs> And the women, your results will vary. Yeah, that's a fair point. Having once been a young male and during that time interacted with many young females, I really don't think that devising an experiment to find out the answer to this was really necessary. Incidentally, to avoid any unnecessary or disgusting confusion, although I have repeatedly used the word young when describing the experiment, I do, of course, mean comparatively young. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Steady on. More specifically, not so young that talking about the experiment should get the video demonetized. Thank you, Dave. Now that's cleared up, let's take a look at exactly how this incredibly unnecessary experiment was carried out. In 1978, Clark persuaded several of his classically attractive psychology students, four males and five females, to randomly approach strangers and say the following, I've been noticing you around campus. I find you to be attractive. Would you like to go to bed with me tonight? Wait, isn't that the lyrics of a song? Isn't this some, like, song from the 90s? Whereas though someone says, I've noticed you around. I find you very attractive. Isn't that a song? I'd ask Siri, but they're never gonna know. If we ask ChatGPT, ChatGPT would know. Sidekick, my new sidekick. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Load <laughs> connection failed. Hello, ChatGPT. I've been thinking of some lyrics from a song, and it goes something like this I've noticed you around, I find you very attractive. Would you like to go to bed with me? Or something like that. I have a feeling it was in the 90s. Can you help me identify what this song was? Of course. Uh, the song you're referring to is called Would You by Touch and Go. It is! It's in the late 90s and is known for its catchy chorus with those exact lyrics. Does that sound right? Yes, it does, you legend. You're so much better than Siri and I love you. Brilliant. So what do you think happens? Well, prepare to be shocked. Out of all the men who were propositioned, 75% of them immediately agreed. <laughs> Just like, yes. 
Yes, I would. The 25% who declined almost exclusively did so on the ground that they were married or in a serious long-term relationship. In a stark but unsurprising contrast, exactly none of the females who were asked the same question by attractive males responded positively. It appears that even in the 1970s, randomly approaching a woman and suggesting sex was as creepy and as weird as it is now. Just in case this had been a fluke and it turns out the young women were not, broadly speaking, much more sensible and responsible from their male counterparts, we all know that it's true. <laughs> Clark repeated the experiment in 1982 with almost identical results. Is anybody surprised? The answer is no. As an interesting side note, while conducting this experiment, the students were instructed to ask the same number of people the same thing, but instead of offering sex, simply to offer a date. While women were slightly more receptive to this less creepy approach, a lower percentage of men were interested in going on a date than they were interested in sex. Hooray for students! And we've learned nothing from this this is just like yeah well okay yeah naturally yeah i agree we we had a hypothesis we don't need an experiment for this one we just know it to be true it's okay you know it to be true well dogs accept robots as their own kinds robo puppy truly is robot's best friend most people simon excluded okay believe that dogs are awesome dogs are fine i just said once that i would do a dog genocide and everyone took that the wrong way Oh, I'm just defending that I don't hate dogs. My reasoning is I just think that dogs deserve their lives less than humans, which apparently is a super controversial thing to say. Because in an early video, I was like, look, there was a person there and a dog there, and someone handed me a gun and said, you have to kill one of these people. One of They're not f***ing people, Simon. <laughs> I had to kill one of them, the dog or the person. I'd always kill the f***ing dog. Why is that so controversial? <laughs> dogs are lower life forms. Get in your f***ing skull. Hashtag cancel Simon, hashtag Simon doesn't give a shit. And also, if you're like, yeah, yeah, I couldn't decide between my child and my dog. And that is genuinely something that's going through your head. There is something wrong with you. How dare you? However, taking care of a dog, especially a puppy, can become an almost full-time occupation. As I write this, I have a German Shepherd Labradoodle cross. Wait, so is that a cross between a German Shepherd, a Labrador, and a... Do doodle poodle poodle laying on my feet and a miniature dash hund trying to climb on my keyboard and although they can be great company they just as often can be a massive pain in the ass to counter some of the more irritating aspects of pet ownership in 1999 sony released the first of several robotic dogs it's 1999 it's gonna be shit. even now it's probably be shit. although those western dynamics or we boston dynamics not western dynamics those robot dogs are creepy especially after that black mirror episode Actually, originally designed as a proof of concept and a way of demonstrating the technology that Sony was working on, such as tiny colored video cameras and directional microphones. Wow, <laughs> the technology! The Ibo, pronounced Ibo, nailed it, quickly caught on among robotics nerds and became an incredibly expensive but quite cool big kids toy. I actually purchased a couple of these secondhand in the early 2000s, and as a robotics nerd and budding program myself, I enjoyed them immensely. Although they could be programmed to do many super cool things, the most popular piece of software allowed you to raise the machine as if it were a a puppy. For the time, the software was fairly incredible. When you first booted it up, it hardly did anything at all. However, over time, it would learn various things by learning from its environment and interacting with the people around it. I take it all back. This is pretty incredible technology for 20 years ago. While from a developing technology point of view, this was fascinating, during the time I owned these two devices, I never thought or came close to thinking that the experience was anything like owning a real dog. However, some scientists obviously did. Not only that, they believed these machines were so much like a real dog that real dogs might be able to get tricked into interacting with them in the same way that they would one of their peers. I mean, dogs are not that clever. Like, especially compared to someone like me, he's big brain. They're like, they're, they're gonna know it's a robot. Or are we about to see just how dumb dogs are? Hashtag cancel Simon. To that end, Sony and the... Oh my god. <laughs> It's in Hungary and it's a university. Ayot Vosloran's university devised in Budapest, devised a set of experiments to find out if dogs reacted differently to a remote control car, an Ibo, an Ibo that smelled like a puppy, and a puppy. Or to put it another way, they wanted to find out if dogs were stupid enough to be tricked into believing that a toy was in fact a puppy. The study produced a paper called Social Behavior of Dogs Encountering Ibo, an animal-like robot in a ne neutral and in, fe in a feeding situation. Catchy name. Oh my god, Academia, can't you come up with more catchy titles? Like, I know it's like, <laughs> you've got to be sensible and stuff, but can't you be like, Are dogs dumb? The big... <laughs> Are dogs dumb? The question everybody needs the answer to. 
or if you're doing a YouTube video, the five things you didn't know about how dumb dogs are. The results were broadly speaking not particularly surprising. According to the paper, our results show that age and context influence the social behavior of dogs. Further, we have found that although both age groups differentiated the living and the non-living te living test partners to some extent, the furry Ibo evoked significantly increased responses in comparison to the car. I read the entirety of this paper so you don't have to, and it appears to demonstrate that younger, less experienced dogs were more inclined to show interest in all of the objects, but they were still much more interested in the real puppy, with the Ibo that smelled like a puppy in second place. Anybody who knows anything about dogs will not be surprised by these findings. Dave, I know nothing about dogs, and I'm also not surprised by these findings in any way whatsoever, because a dog preferring a dog, and then the dog thing that smells like a dog, and then a fucking remote control car, because, again, obviously. But I suppose research teams have to justify their budget somehow. Bizarrely, the model of Ibo that was predominantly used during the experiments, the ERS-220, was never actually supposed to look like a dog anyway. It was based loosely, and I mean very loosely, on a lion cub. I'm not sure that using one of your dog-based models would have made a huge difference, though. Remote-controlled animals. Have you ever wished that you could control your pets via remote control? Don't have any pets, so the answer's no. But if I did have pets, the answer would be hell yes, because that sounds crazy. <laughs> Humans are the pets. At the risk of coming across as a crazy dog person by mentioning my own dogs twice in a video, I know I certainly have. Being able to mute my shepherd when it decides to bark at a passing carrier bag at two o'clock in the morning, or forcing the dashun to go outside and pee all from a handy remote control or an app on my phone would be living the dream. Robo puppy commencing two-hour yipping session. <laughs> You know how you can live the dream, Dave? And so you don't have to worry about those things. Don't have dogs. My goodness, what an idea. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I know people are like, and it's. I know the biggest argument against this is because name a person you know who has a dog and is like, oh, no, I regret having a dog. Everyone loves their dogs. I just like, no, like my um, family-in-law. What do you call it? Like my wife's sister's family like my family in law they have a dog and it like dictates their life like it dictates where they go on holiday it dictates where they can go on the weekend it dictates what restaurants they can go to and it's like i don't want to live that nightmare as much as i know i would love having a dog i oh, just like, i can't i can't do that i've also got two kids it's enough i've got enough to look after but are such things even possible well and i feel like i say a lot of this kind of jose M. R. delgado a native of the home of bovine cruelty what was one of the pioneers when it comes to the modern study of just what you can do to a brain with artificial electrical interference having already discovered that he could use implanted electrodes to induce rage pleasure drowsiness and involuntary movements in his test subjects both animal and human he decided to take his research one step further in an experiment which would later be described by the new york times as the most spectacular demonstration ever performed of the deliberate modification of animal behavior through external control of the brain again academia get it together delgado would attempt to defy almost certain death after requiring Lucero, a 250 kilogram fighting bull, that's 551 pounds, he proceeded to carry out a couple of modifications on the creature. These particular modifications involved inserting several electrodes into specific parts of its brain. Several days later, he was ready to test out his work. In a small training ring surrounded by members of the press and curious public onlookers, he faced off against Lucero. After pissing off the bull in the usual way, it charged toward him. You are insane. What happened next was described in the newspaper article from the time. Suddenly, the bull Suddenly, the bull faces him and charges. Taking a couple of steps back, the investigator presses a button on the box to send a radio signal, and the bull halts in mid-stride. It turns away. The animal's natural aggression had evaporated. Delgado's experiment caused something of a stir at the time, most likely due to its visual impressiveness. Although more recently, several people have claimed that it was nothing more than a publicity stunt. Even if this is true, it's still a crazy experiment. Yeah, it's an awesome publicity stunt. He turned off a bull's aggression. Having once been traveling in a car that hit, hit a bull, oh my lord, Dave. I could personally attest to just how much damage they can cause. The bull did not die, but the car did. And along with that, it's time to bring this episode to a close. If I may, I'd like to leave you with the following thought. And now for my final thought. Although an idea might seem crazy to you when you first think of it, just remember, if people didn't carry out crazy experiments, we'd never have come down from the trees in the first place. Maybe we should have stayed in the trees, Dave. Although, I don't know, I found these experiments just awesome. <laughs> I missed my calling as a mad scientist. There's no such thing as an unnecessary sex experiment, Dave.